Hello everyone, my name is Reverend Doug Newfeld here at Trinity United Brandon and uh, we're so thankful that you've chosen to join us in this virtual time of worship uh, on, this, on the 16th Sunday after Pentecost, September 20th, 2020. Uh, we uh, we want to thank you for joining us and your continued support and uh, I want to thank you all for uh, so many great comments, emails, letters uh, this past week. And uh, it's, uh, it's really great to uh, see that we're still uh, connecting with uh, uh, people from all over. Uh, wanna, we've, been giving, we've been asking people to uh, come forward uh, to help participate in our virtual worship. And so I want to thank uh, Sherry Splett for uh, offering to be our guest reader today and so you'll be hearing from her in a bit and uh, and I want to continue to extend the invitation to anyone else who'd like to participate in the service in any way that they feel feel that the spirit moves them um, if, you know especially if uh, someone has some musical gifts to share uh, we'd uh, we'd love to hear from you we can provide uh, the recording time uh, with great flexibility, whatever sort of works for you, and, uh, and it's done in a safe, uh, healthy space. You don't have to worry about, uh, you know, pandemic uh, health concerns. So as we move into this time of worship, I invite you to calm your mind and open your hearts to the Word of God. United in one spirit, we are called to stand strongly. United in one mind, we are called to live faithfully. Please join me in the call to worship. Stand firm, children of God. We come to serve the Lord. Stand firm, children of God. We come to stand in unity and love. Stand firm, children of God. We come to live faithfully and fully in Christ. Let us pray. Love through us, living God, in the power of your Holy Spirit. Love through us, Holy One, by the grace of your child, Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith that we may respond with trust and hope. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Our first hymn today uh, is from Voices United 227, For the Fruit of All Creation. Uh, this very much ties into our Matthew reading today. And uh, also in the fall, with harvest going on, uh, there's all kinds of imagery that, uh, is really connects, that really connects to the season. Please join me in the singing of For the Fruit of All Creation.
The scripture reading for today is Matthew 20, 1, verse 16. The laborers in the vineyard. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give you this last, the same as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with my, what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Again, we just want to thank Sherry for that reading. That is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So a quick recap of this parable. Uh, and, and one of the important thing in the very first line, this is one of uh, Jesus' trademark, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like dot, dot, dot. You know, a, a, again, a, a story as a descriptor of the kingdom of heaven. And so there's this uh, landowner, and he, uh, he goes to hire uh, laborers for the day, and so it says he starts early, and it's probably not unrealistic, you know, that it's uh, uh, in, you know, at daybreak. Uh, we're talking about a place in the world that's very close to the equator, so the sun rises at 6, it's, it sets at 6, and uh, so we're thinking it's probably pretty close to 6 a.m., and uh, he chooses some laborers from there and uh, negotiates a wage and uh, takes them to his uh, vineyard, uh, as we assume is for harvest. Then at uh, 9 o'clock, he goes back to the market, uh, looks around for some uh, more help. Uh, again, you know, the, the statement is uh, he tells them he will pay them what is right and uh, invites them to his vineyard. And he does the same again at noon and at 3 and then at uh, 5 o'clock, he goes back again, late in the day. Remember, it gets dark at 6 o'clock. He's, he's, uh, he's there at 5, and uh, he sees, you know, some men still, like, standing around, and he, and he asks, you know, why are you standing around? And they answer, well, no one has hired us. And so he says, well, go to, the, the, go to my vineyard, and, uh, and so they do. And so then it's time to pay uh, the, the laborers for their day, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the last who arrived, he the, the pays them first, and he pays them uh, a, a full denarii, the, the, uh, a, a day's wage, even though they're only there an hour. And, uh, and so ultimately, as we know from the story, the, the, the ones that got there first early in the morning, they get upset that they didn't get paid more because they only got paid a denarii as well. Everyone got paid the same amount, whether they started at 6 a.m. or they started at 5 p.m. So this, uh, this parable has some similarities uh, to the prodigal son parable in Luke 15. And, you know, near the end when the elder son complains to his father that that uh, the father never celebrated his continuous faithfulness, but that younger brother who 
took off with and blew his inheritance on gambling and women, when he returns home, gets a big party with the fatted calf. And so this, this uh, you know, the, there's a piece of this in the prodigal son, but, but this, uh, the story of the laborers in the vineyard is, is really, there's, there's this, this, you know, very dominant topic of fairness. You know, what is fair? And maybe even how do we understand fairness? I mean, was the landowner unfair, right? That, uh, you know, can we identify with the workers that are hired first? I mean, how would you feel? You sweated in the hot sun for 12 hours and, uh, and uh, you get paid for the same as that someone that just showed up uh, an hour before quitting time? I mean, you know, can you relate to that? Can you, you know, can you imagine yourself in that spot or maybe even have a personal experience that might somehow kind of identify with that? You know, I was, uh, um, in my retail experience, um, I've, uh, I've uh, I tried to figure out really how many people I've employed uh, over my, whatever it was, 26, 27 years of retail experience, retail management, and I figured that there's over a couple of thousand people that I, different people that I employed over time, and, uh, and at times I, I was directly responsible for up to, you know, about 150 people. And, um, you know, this idea of fairness and pay, I mean, it always comes up. I mean, we had a policy that it was, you know, against company policy to discuss your rate of pay, but people always talked. People always knew what each other were making. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the institutions I worked for, we didn't, like, pay everyone the exact same because we, we, we people... Uh, got, got raises through time, you know, rewarding loyalty, but we also, in hiring new people, we recognized past experience, and it wasn't um, unheard of that, you know, someone with 10 years of related experience, they would get hired at the five-year rate. So someone who had no experience and been working with the company two, three, four years could be making less money than a person who had just got hired uh, at the same position. And so those issues always came out. Or uh, one of the ones that stands out most in my mind is that uh, it was in Alberta at the time of, uh, uh, of the, you know, the big oil boom, and uh, there was negative unemployment, and it was really hard to hire. I think at any given time, we were 30 to 35 people short. And one of the positions, we, the hardest position we had to hire for were called unloaders. And they were the ones that unloaded the trucks. And, and, that, that, uh, and the shift was, you know, it wasn't a great shift because it started at 3.30 in the afternoon and went till midnight. And because that's how it fit in for when the trucks arrived and then the, the, the freight was unloaded so that the overnight stalkers, uh, the, the freight would be available for the overnight stalkers to put on the shelves. And a uh, very physical job. And, uh, and so, you know, and then not only that, but it was, um, you know, it was, a, it was a rotating shift, so you also had to work weekends, so it was a bad shift, you know. Uh, I worked some weekends, and it was physically challenging. Um, and, so, uh, and so we had so much trouble hiring for this position that we, you know, it's a whole supply and demand thing, right? So what do you do? You try to make an incentive for people to take that position. So we raised the uh, hourly rate until actually the rate for an unloader was greater than a department manager. Now, our department managers, they were, there was sort of the top echelon pay group, um, you know, underneath the salaried management. And uh, they, they were responsible for departments, and uh, it, would, it took a lot of training and skill, you know, and skill uh, that they, they, they worked their way up to. And so, suddenly, unloaders could make more money, and an unloader could be trained in their job in a day, and all of a sudden, unloaders were making more than department managers, and that was a problem. They screamed bloody murder. That uh, how could an unloader, a lowly unloader, be making more money than a department manager? And so when you told them, well, if you want to make unloader money, become an unloader because we have <laughs> positions open. Well, they didn't want to hear that. But this whole idea of about, about what they've earned, what they've, they've, uh, they've uh, been promoted into should be you know, rewarded. And what they viewed was a superior position. 
So in this, this parable, it's, it's obvious that what Jesus was referring to, that, that he was referring to that, you know, we, again, the, 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 the parable starts off, you know, you know, this is the kingdom of heaven is like, well, obviously the landowner is God. So are we asking the question here, is God unfair? So let's take a closer look at this parable. First thing, I mean, and it wasn't included in today's reading, but if you go to the end of uh, uh, chapter 19, uh, this, this, today's parable is, is, is following, uh, immediately follows the disciples saying, you know, to Jesus, we've been with you since the beginning and we left everything behind, you know, hey, what's, what's in it for us? I mean, we should get something extra, we should get something more, right? And uh, Jesus responds with this, this parable. And so, you know, as we start off this parable, you know, the marketplace, or you want to talk, call it the town square, you know, this is where all the action, this is where all the business happens. I mean, back then, you couldn't put an ad in the paper to hire people. There was no electronic I- online or, or, uh, or headhunters uh, type services. You know, what you did was, um, if you were someone who needed help, you went to the square where anyone who wanted to work showed up and you said, hey, you, 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 come with me, and um, I'm going to put you to work. And they would do that on a daily basis. All right? And so the fair uh, rate of pay that they talk of, and some, some uh, depending on how you, you uh, translate the original scripture, some, some translations use the term denarian or denarii. Um, a denarii was considered the minimum wage, or what, what the amount, the, the coin was worth a day's you know, unskilled labor. And that, and, that, and that day's labor equated to what it cost to live for a day, or for you and your family to live for a day. And so if you didn't work on a given day, that means you didn't eat. You know, if you were one of these unskilled laborers uh, looking for, for general farmhand. So, uh, so keeping this in mind, you know, you're only making enough to feed yourself and your family for the day. And then also you think about at five o'clock, why hadn't those workers been chosen? Why were these workers left behind? And so you can think it was, it's really like, and if you can relate to this, maybe back in grade school at the time, right when you used to pick teams, you used to get a couple of captains, and so then you would choose your teams, you know, and, and uh, we all know how this all goes down, right? You know, we know who gets picked first. You know, if you're, we're talking about the athletics, you know, the biggest, the strongest, the fastest, the most skilled at the sport, and then who gets picked last? Well, the small, unskilled, clumsy type people. You can also put in uh, the social aspect. Friends would pick friends. You know, those sort of more socially outcast would be picked near the end. And so this, this, this is a bit of a snapshot of the picture too. These are the workers left over that didn't get chosen first. Because those, those uh, landowners would have picked those that they knew, those that they had used before, those that were quality workers, the biggest, the strongest, the, those that they thought could you know, get the most for their, their, their daily wage. The ones left over, sort of the outcast, maybe the old, the frail, you know, but people that still need to eat too. And as you know from my analogy with picking teams, do different people get picked first the next day? No, generally with a group of people that you know, same people get picked first, same people get picked last. So also some of these people might not have eaten yesterday. You know, did they, did they get picked yesterday and, or the day before? Have they gone hungry for a couple days? So when you kind of, you know, look at it through this lens, you know, uh, the, uh, the disciples who Jesus is telling this parable to, 
and also Matthew, the writer, when he wrote this for the audience he was writing this for, they would understand this scene about what happens. They've probably witnessed or been a part of it in the marketplace many times. And not only that, the disciples would have identified with the first workers. In fact, they're the ones that offered that up at the beginning. So when we look through it at this lens, that the, 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 uh, the, the landowner comes at 5 o'clock, only an hour left, sees the leftovers, the people who didn't get chosen, and literally in an act of gratitude, or act of, in an act of graciousness, of charity, he invites them to his, his, his vineyard and pays them a full day's wage. I mean, how could he pay them anything less, right? I mean, you have someone come out, you're not going to give them enough money to even eat that day, you know? And so, and, so, uh, and so it's when the others figured that when those only got what they needed to survive for the day, that they should get more. So now I ask the question again, is God unfair? Is God unfair if God provides for everyone's needs? You know, because everything we have is actually not ours, but it's a, actually a gift from God. And if we have everything we need, is it right to claim we deserve more? Especially in a world where there are so many who don't have what they need. And this is an interesting thing, the word need. What does, and I think, I, I've spoken, I believe, on this uh, before, that how in our current society, the word need and the word want has kind of been blurred. How we use the word need when it's really just something we want. Hey, Mom, I need a new pair. I need that new pair of Air Jordans that just came out. You have a perfectly good pair of basketball shoes. No, I need them, right? Or I need a new dress for the school dance. I mean, we can put tons of examples on it. I mean, here's, here's one from my own history. Dad, I need a new dirt bike. I need a new dirt bike. I actually said those words. Not my proudest moment. I mean, my excuse is I was 14 or 15. Teenagers, we're, they're terrible people anyways. But, uh, but yeah, I'm pretty ashamed of that now. How, how do I need a new dirt bike? Oh, I wanted a new dirt bike. Definitely didn't need one. I, I uh, listened to a great uh, podcast. Uh, I actually listen to this podcast frequently, and I invite you to... Uh, to uh, Google, search pulpitfiction.com, and um, it's a, a great resource for ministers for sermon prep or Bible study prep, uh, and uh, um, super interesting guys, really know their stuff. Maybe I shouldn't invite you to watch them because I, I take stuff from that podcast very frequently, but uh, they made this great association with this, this, uh, this parable in, in the context of um, you know, the Black Lives Matter um, issue that's, that's, that's been going on, or, or, or this, I mean, it's been an issue for hundreds of years, but very prominent right now in, uh, in the news and, and, and in society. And, uh, and I've been meaning to talk about this for a while, but the whole idea of Black Lives Matter and, and some of the response that comes from when people hear that term Black Lives Matter. Have you ever heard anyone respond, well, all lives matter? Interesting. I mean, of course, all lives matter. But the whole reason why this is, you know, like a slogan is because it suggests that black lives don't matter. And that's why the message needs to be that, that they matter. 
And so who is it that's saying, well, all lives matter? Well, the reality is, most of the time, it's not brown people or indigenous people or Muslims or any other group you want to identify that, that, that really could probably be lumped into Black Lives Matter. You could substitute the first word black with, with some other descriptor of, a, of an oppressed group. But the reality is that all lives matter. Who does that come from? Predominantly white people. And why is that? Why is that the response? Well, it really comes from a place of white privilege. Now, some people, in fact, someone just this past week in a significant leadership position from a very powerful country, you know, basically denied that white privilege was a thing. And, you know, and if, if you don't feel that white privilege is a thing, well, you're entitled to your opinion, but I'm brave enough to say that you're wrong. White privilege is a thing in our society, in the Western world, because I'll put you through this litmus test. And this is for you white people. Have you ever not, have, have, have you ever not been hired for a job because of the color of your skin? Have you ever been looked over for a promotion because of the color of your skin? Have you ever received inferior customer service because you're white? I mean, there's many more questions that could go along with this, but people of color they have very different answers to this question in our, in our society. The reality is white people in our society sit in a place of privilege. We get put at the front of the line. We get picked first in, in, in what is described as systematic racism um, all the time. We benefit literally by the color of our skin, and that's what white privilege is. And this, 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 this response to Black Lives Matter, that all lives matter, that comes from a place of white privilege. That comes from people, they might be thinking, well, it's, and it's inclusive, they, it might be under the guise of inclusiveness, that, that we are all the same and that we should all be equal, but what it really comes from is that I like my privilege and I'm scared that if everybody gets treated equally, well, I won't get those same privileges. I won't be paid more if pay equity is in place. And the list goes on and on. This parable is not about feeling guilty for having abundance. It's more about being grateful for what you've been blessed with and also about sharing that with others who, have, who are without. But mostly, it's a wonderful message of hope. Because what it's saying is that anyone at any time who comes to God will receive God's grace. You don't have to be there first. You don't have to put in X amount of time. You don't have to win favor. If you give yourself to God now, you will be blessed now. Let us pray. God of hope, when the world is bleak and dim, you pierce the shadows with light. You help us see new paths and possibilities for hope in times of despair, for clarity when we felt confused, for a way forward when we thought all was lost. We give you thanks. We pray today for those who feel hopeless, for those who are sick or dying, for those who mourn. 
and for those weighed down by heavy burdens. May each of us know and share your gift of hope. God of peace, all around us there is conflict. In our world, our communities, our families, even in our closest relationships. We thank you for steps towards reconciliation in our lives, our communities, and among peoples of different cultures and histories. We pray today for places where pain, violence, and cruelty seem to have an upper hand. May each of us know and share your gift of peace. God of joy, we give you thanks for moments of delight and occasions of celebrations for happy gatherings, gentle solitude, pleasure given and received. For laughter, friendship, and love, we remember those who do not taste such joy, those who are lonely or bitter, hurt or difficult to love. May each of us know and share your gift of joy. God of love in Jesus Christ, your love was born in a human life. Jesus was rooted in a particular family, yet his love stretched far beyond to include outsiders and those rejected by others. We are so grateful to be part of this circle, and we pray for our families, those closest to us, and anyone estranged. We pray for friends and for acquaintances, strangers, for those very different from ourselves, and even for our enemies. Help us draw our circles of affection wider, seeing our kinship with all people. May each of us know and each share your gift of love. Hear us now as we pray in silence for those who have come to mind this day. And now in one voice, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught, knowing that you are our mother and our father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So for our last hymn, I thought I'd do something a little different. Um, I had got an email uh, from someone outside of our congregation, uh, someone that's been uh, watching, thanks to the power of... of uh, the internet, virtual worship, and uh, uh, Ariel Blackman from Queens, New York, she asked if I would consider doing My Faith Looks Up to Thee. Now, uh, this particular hymn is not in our hymn books, United Church of Canada, uh, and the and reality is, so I, I, I googled it, I, I, uh, I, I streamed it, and I, I didn't recognize it. But as I looked and listened through the lyrics, it was so much like a prayer that I, was, I felt compelled that, that, that this should be shared. And so uh, uh, we thank Ariel for her, uh, her uh, suggestion. And, uh, and so uh, I'm going to play this video that, uh, uh, that's sung by the Dallas Christian Adult Concert Choir. And, uh, and I'd be interested if you're familiar with it, because I, I wasn't but uh, it's uh, very much growing on me. So please enjoy now, my faith looks up to thee.
We want to thank everyone who supported uh, us through this time of pandemic. And even though the pews are empty and I'm, I'm uh, in your homes through uh, the internet, uh, I want to thank you so much for your support, for continuing to support the church and, uh, and supporting your own churches if you're, if you're someone that's not part of our, our community. Uh, the world needs your help. And, and, and as the uh, parable of, uh, of the laborers in the vineyard, um, please be aware of, of, uh, of, of all that we are blessed with and that there are so many people in this world that, that don't have what they need. And, uh, and so uh, any, any ability of you to share that with others is definitely uh, an action of God's grace and, uh, and a blessing to you all. Go forth with the strength of the Holy Spirit. Love with the grace of Jesus Christ. Rejoice in the steadfast love of God. Amen.